donkeys are an endangered breed of donkey, very large donkey as you can see. Part of my job is to work with and train these animals. So this team is Mary, who's a very new mammoth donkey, and then Katie, who's an old mule, who we use to train all of our, our newest recruits. And maybe uh, with fossil fuels making problems these days, we may end up using a lot more mules in the future. I would hope so. So here we are at the Hunger Mountain Co-op where Kayla Hamill is delivering eggs this morning with her friend Karen. Kayla, tell us a little bit about uh, how you weekly come here uh, and deliver eggs. So this whole outfit is from Vermont Compost, which is a compost company about two miles up the road. There is a small group of mammoth donkeys and one mule. Today we have one of the mammoth donkeys. This is Ruby. She is a 17-year-old Janet. Uh, and so once a week, every Wednesday morning, we come down with eggs produced by the chickens at Vermont Compost and deliver them here to the co-op to sell to consumers. Our program today, the fifth in a series on exploring climate change in Vermont demonstrates a real and practical solution to the bad effects of fossil fuels, showing how we can train draft animals for logging, for plowing, and for pulling carts. The Amish provide a good example today in the use of draft animals. Cuba, short on fossil fuel, has allotted hundreds of thousands of acres for organic farm co-ops where the soil is tilled with animals, not tractors. Could this be Vermont's not-so-distant future? using draft animals like we used to a hundred years ago. The training of draft animals can play a big role in the solutions to climate change, particularly in an agricultural state. All right, so as Steve said, my name is Kaylee Hamill. I'm um, from right here in Montpelier, Vermont. Currently, um, where I work, my business is really all over. What I do for a living is training large animals, equines and bovines, which includes horses, donkeys, mules, and cattle. And so I will train animals for other people, and I also offer sleigh rides, um, weddings, wagon rides, um, a variety of different services with my own animals. And so part of what I was showing Steve is what goes into training all the animals I work with and um, really what goes into running my business. Concerning climate change in Vermont, our program demonstrates a real and practical solution to the bad effects of fossil fuel, showing how we can train draft animals for logging, plowing, pulling carts, and much more. Could this be Vermont's 
not so distant future using draft animals like we used to a hundred years ago think about it this is a climate change solution I definitely think so I think it's plausible especially considering the fact that people have been using animals to work the land and for transportation for thousands of years we've only recently transitioned away from that say a hundred years ago so yeah we tend to be short-sighted don't we <laughs> <laughs> now we'll go to the Kaylee's Braveheart farm home of her business called Braveheart Beasts but before we go there, I want to make an observation that I ask you to follow carefully. My father, a Nebraska rancher, taught me to break my wild Pasifino stallion and my quarter horse stallion. Their training was long and laborious and sometimes a dangerous experience during which they more or less broke me as well. My methods were forceful and unpleasant for the horse. I want you to take close notice of the stark difference between my traditional methods and Kaylee's. See how patient, gentle, kind, affectionate, and focused she is as she trains a variety of horses, mammoth donkeys, oxen, and her 18 hands tall Percheron draft horses, which are many times her weight. Said are our not so large animals. The two spotted ones here are each boys. This is Julius, and this is his teammate, Roman. And they're a team I matched and drove um, a little while ago, two summers ago, and my mom ended up falling in love with them and buying them from me. So currently they're her pets, the little pasture ornaments, just looking handsome. All right, so this is Lady. She is a four-year-old miniature horse. Oh, I consider her to be a dwarf horse just because of her size and proportions. Uh, it kind of leans her into a genetic rarity of, of dwarfism. You can see she has a little bold forehead. Her legs are very short. Her belly is very wide. She's just a little out of proportion. And only 29 inches tall. She's completely full grown. Um, and so I got Lady, um, I think I mentioned before, to be a, a therapy horse. Because she's a perfect size for it, but very quickly I figured out she's not a perfect disposition. She's what we call a one-person horse, so she's very oriented to working and connecting with one person rather than being friendly toward everybody. And so I quickly became that one person as I started to embark on trick training with her. And so she's been learning tricks with me for about six months and we have learned quite a bit. Um, we have a couple of tricks we'll do here in the barn and I also am training her to do what's called liberty work, which is where she moves just based on my body language. And we can probably demonstrate a couple turns and some backing up with that in here you just usually need a lot more space so we have a little routine if i can get her attention there we go we are at attention i have a little grain in my pocket you can see she knows that are you ready can you say hello look at that good girl that's hello. Said, hello look at that good now lady you want to do some tricks <laughs> yes we want to do some tricks you're not going to forget are you i didn't think so <laughs> all right now Looking at you, you're pretty small, and you're pretty cute. Can you be a little cuter? Do a little smile? That's her little smile. You can see her little, hey, focus. Nope. <laughs> There's that. Now, can I have a kiss? She's getting a little carried away. Uh-oh. She is not performing by any means, and Lady is a mare, and for those who aren't experienced with horses, mares, um, tend to be a little bit, they, they have a little bit of an attitude. 
She's demonstrating a little bit of an attitude right now. She, right now, is just throwing every trick in the book at me because all she wants is food. <laughs> um, and this, this really is just part of what comes with working with these animals. They have good days and bad days. So when this happens, all we do is pick up where we left off, which is a kiss. So she's waving right now. I'm not going to acknowledge her waving. We ask for a kiss. Uh -huh. Aren't you good? Oh, give me a kiss. Those are kisses, uh -huh. so then we're going to say, good job. Can I have a high five? High five? There it is, good job. Do a little bit of a high five. Wait. Have a shake. Can we shake with this one? You got to reach and shake it. There you go. Good. All right, now we'll see how much focus we have. Can you spin? Good girl. Have it the other way. The other way. Good job, lady. Good girl. All right, now we're going to do a couple more things. Hi. I'm going to ask her. Nope. Nope. Come here. So ground zero for her is her shoulder against my hip or leg at okay. her Okay. Uh-huh. And so by using my body language, I can ask her to do different things with her body um, and position herself just with me without a halter. So I'm going to try and do this so that you can see it. Ah, ah. Oh, Lord, we're still distracted. Still distracted. Ready? Up. Ready? Ready? Up. Woo. Oh. Ready? Up. Look at you. Good girl. All right. And then finally, you can do it. Wait. Okay, that was good. Doesn't she That's bow? Good. Or she, not bow, she, she walks pretty. Yeah, we're, we're about to do that. So that is all of her tricks right now. We're working on a Spanish walk, uh, which we'll see. I don't want to go too far out of the light. We'll try this, right? Can we do it? Good. Oh, Next one. look at that. Next one. Good. She has to come forward. Oh, wait. Wait one second. So all this is going to do is I will touch. Come here. Which leg I want. And then the next one. And the next one. Look at that. And the next one. There we go. Isn't that something? Good. Good. Ready? Hup. Hup. Come on. Yay. Oh. Hey. Good. We have to get grain. That was a little rough. We made it through. We made it through. Come here. Come on. Go ahead. Come on. Come on. And here is our farm hand, Chris, Chris <laughs> who comes to and help he us doesn't like the routinely. word farm hand because he's a hunter. Yeah. <laughs> All right, go be free. Go. Well, that was a good demonstration. Well, thank you. Uh, here's Kaylee with two <laughs> percherons that we have rounded up in the forest. And now uh, Kayla, Kaylee will tell us about these horses. All right, so a primary part of my business is doing what they call agritourism, which is offering things like sleigh rides, wagon rides, even weddings um, to the public as a service. And so this team here is, as you said, a team of Percheron draft horses. They're a type of French draft horse, very common in the US. Um, and I use them as my primary team to do all of those things with. So on the weekends, we do farmer's markets, we do fall wagon rides, sleigh rides in the winter, we've done weddings, funerals, all of that with um, a vast array of equipment. And so these horses, this is Twinkle. She is a mare. Um, she is four years old right now. I've had her since she was a yearling and I have trained her myself. She was actually the first horse I ever personally trained. I had worked with quite a few prior. She is very big, and actually, as I said, she's only four, and so she is still growing. She weighs about 1,700 pounds right now. Is what they call 18 hands at her shoulder. Every hand is four inches, so 18 hands is six feet at her withers here, and she'll gain pro probably 500 more pounds before she's finished at seven years old. She's very young and new to the whole working scheme, whereas this very gentle, kind boy. This is King. He's a 14-year-old gelding that I uh, brought home last fall to work with as a teammate for Twinkle. And so King is much more experienced at working than Twinkle is. <laughs> whoa, man. Whoa. Whoa. Are you coming to say hello? 
Good. <laughs> and so what we do is by harnessing them up together, King helps Twinkle learn about the working world. So about working in traffic, standing still, being a, a decent civilized member of society. And so far she's catching on very quickly. Ready? Can't to smile. There they are. She's actually losing teeth right now. Yep, they're called caps, baby teeth. And so she's lost a couple caps. If you look in there, she has buck teeth. You see her buck teeth? Okay. Now, Twinkle is always very good about a halter, so is King. Um, but what can be particularly tricky with draft horses because of their size? They can learn to put their heads way up in the air so that you can't actually slip it over there. Uh, but these guys, we keep work very fun and engaging, so they look forward to halter because they know it means time to come out and do some some fun activities. Today, it will most likely just be interacting and grooming and loving, which is very important. All right, the thing is a little bit in my way. I'm gonna move him. Here. They're very spatially aware of where their feet are. Horses, because their eyes are positioned on the sides of their heads, as opposed to humans where we're front facing, can see 360 degrees around them and can very easily see all four of their feet. And so, because of that, they should be aware of you enough to not step on, on your toes. Um, but for being a horse I've trained myself and also since I've had her uh, since she was a baby, we have a very close relationship, as you can see. Hello. Um, and so right now, I'm just I'm going to jump on her back, and we're just going to ride around bareback a little bit, just to have some fun. Um, with every animal I work with, it is really important to keep things fun and engaging. And um, part of how we keep things engaging is every specific animal, whether it's a horse, an ox, cow, donkey, they all have a specific way of thinking. And so as a trainer, it's up to me to learn and use their ways of thinking to help communicate what I'd like them to do. When it's twilight on the trail and I jog along The world is like a dream and the rest. Here I want you to see the contrast in size between Twinkle at 18 hands high and Lady at 29 inches high. All right, so each of these guys is part of a team of oxen. Um, so this is Indy and Boone, a team visiting from New York for three months just so I can train them to their basic commands. And then these two little red ones is, are Justice and Legend, um, a team that I bought personally to train and then sell to somebody looking to either get into working oxen or who have been working oxen for a little while. And so when I, when I say oxen, common misconception is that oxen is a specific breed. But really, any breed can be trained to be an ox, since ox is actually more of a title. Uh, so when we start training a team of oxen, we start with animals about this size. They're known as bull calves because they're still intact. And um, as you work with them after they've been castrated, if they're being trained to work, they're known as working steers. If they're not being trained to work, they're just known as a steer. And so the working steers, as they learn to work on a cart and pull logs and really kind of get adjusted to a working lifestyle, They'll be known as working steers until they're four years old, which is when they're considered fully mature, and then they'll be known as oxen. So it is really quite the process, which all of these boys have started on, um, and they're all doing very well with their training. So. so there are teams out there that pull competitively. There are teams that are worked primarily on farms, and there are also teams that are primarily shown at county fairs. Um, right now, it's mostly popular to show a team just because People, most people anyway, aren't really set up to have applicable work, say, in, in a field or in the woods, but I have known plenty of teams that actually help their teamster make a living and earn their wages by, by working. So this is a team of 
team of Holstein calves. They're four months going on five months old. This is Boone and Indy. They're a team visiting um, around New York. They're going to be with me for three months to learn their basic commands and how to work in a yoke, pull a cart, um, and a little log. And then they'll go back home to the farmer they came from to continue their work with their teams, teamster and, and owner and um, grow up to be a working farm team. So, so far, what I've been covering with them in the yoke, like I said, is their basic command. Uh, I haven't hooked them up to anything as of yet. Today, hopefully, we're going to hook them to the cart for the first time and introduce them to some turns with a pole in between them, um, which is a very important skill for a team to have. Right now, though, I'm going to go over some of our um, preliminary work um, exercises for their activities, and then I'll go through how to yoke up a team. Uh, so with these boys, they were started really into training at about three months old, um, which is a little bit older than when we like to start them. And it's very, um, it's pretty amazing actually how fast these young animals will become set in their ways and um, attuned to their own agenda as opposed to the agenda of their teamster. And so when you start older animals, say three months old like these guys were, they were a little bit hesitant to go along with um, what I was asking them to do, how I was asking them to behave. And so what we do to kind of reverse that is to build a really trusting relationship. So the first problem I ran into is that they were a little bit um, spooky, meaning that they didn't like to have hands on them. They didn't really like to be approached. Uh, that could be because of one of two things. It could be just because they didn't have a lot of handling as young cats or that they're still being activated to a new space, a new person, and they still need a little bit more of those craft exercises. So in order to overcome that, we always start our work um, or our, our play, as I like to call it, with young animals. These animals are young to the point where they shouldn't really be working. All the activities they're doing should be enjoyable and should be establishing really enthusiastic attitudes so that by the time they're older, they'll be happy to see the yoke come out and go and um, be productive and get a lot done with their teamster. So back to what I was saying, we start our exercises with a, a body rub down. And so this does two things. You can see Boone here is already starting to pull back on, on his halter. And that's because I just entered what's called his flight zone which is the area around his body, or how close I can get to his body without him becoming uncomfortable. So while I do this, I don't want him pulling on his halter. I want him relaxed. So I'm gonna ask him for it. I'm gonna go again. And so I'm gonna start at his head. And I am really just going to rub down, and if he steps back, I'm gonna ask him to step forward. And so this gets him used to me being close to his body and also helps him associate my touch with positive things, because all of this feels really good to him. This is when we can itch all those places that he can't itch himself. <laughs> and I'm going to go on to his other side. It's important to do this on both sides, because these animals, horses too, won't um, transfer what happens on one side of their body to the, to the other. So whatever exercise you do on one side, you have to do on the other. So he moved there because I touched a ticklish spot under his belly, right here. So I am just going to keep my hand here until he relaxes like that and I'll take it away. And so that release is his reward. So this to him was uncomfortable the first time I touched it and I just held it there until he relaxed. And then I released when he did relax so I know that's what I wanted him to do. So you can see he's much more calm when I touch it and I'll touch his legs. Good. So he picked up his foot, and that's because he's, he's a smart boy. And that's also what we do. I handle their feet before we yoke up. This is so that when they're big, if they're working in the field and they get a, a stone caught in their hooves, they won't kick or fight for you to pick up their foot and take it out. So I'm going to do the back one. And so he's allowed to kick a little bit. It's a very odd feeling to stand on three legs. And so I'll hold it until he's relaxed like this, and then once again that release is to put it down to reward it. I'm going to ask him to move his butt and just straighten out a little bit. Like I said, I have to do it on both sides. So here's this foot, and it's very good. And put it down. There's this foot. Very good. All right. So that's Boone. I'm going to go and do Indy. Very quickly, you probably won't be able to see much because Boone will be blocking the view. Yeah, you 
step back and I have some stuff forward. And you can watch too as I do this. Boone's demeanor has already changed. Indies will change as I do this. This helps them relax, which is very important before you start to work a team. I always like to start with an exercise like this or even just brushing them down to help them once again enjoy coming out and being with me and getting some work done. And ask me, oh, good. You can see how relaxed he is about this. This is what you're going for. He's very comfortable, he's not struggling, not fighting. So I'll ask him for his front one. There we go. When I do this, I don't want all their weight on me either. So if he was to put his weight on me, I'd gently let his foot to the ground, down to the ground, so that he knew he had to hold it up if it was gonna stay up in the air. Because these guys are each, oh, probably 350 pounds right now. When they're full grown, average size for a Holstein steer is about 2,500 pounds. So you don't want a 2,500 pound animal leaning all of their weight into your hand if you're trying to lift the foot. So we're gonna pick this up. Very good. There we go. And the last one. Very nice. I'm going to do some rubbing. You can see he's already substantially more relaxed than when we started. And this is a pretty unique exercise. I, for one, haven't come across anybody else that does this with calves. Uh, but in the long run, it really it does help because it really helps to develop a good relationship, a lot of trust, which is important from an early stage. So that's that. We have them nice and relaxed. So the first step to yoking up, I'm going to remove their collars. These calves wear collars because at night they each have their own little stall where they go to be tied. We, we like to tie these guys up at night because it helps them um, establish patience, helps them kind of get an idea of what, what boundaries are, and it gives them their own room, per se. They don't have to share with anybody else. So, so their collars are off. So this here is the yoke I use to train all sorts of calves. This yoke has been around the block a time or two. <laughs> And so um, I make these from small sizes like this all the way up to the big sizes you need with a full grown team. And so this yoke in particular is made out of birch. Uh, typically they're made out of hardwood, birch, cherry, elm, ash, um, even maple, anything that can withstand stress from pulling. And so when I say yoke, I'm referring to this body here in my arms and then these two U-shaped pieces of wood are called bows. They're completely separate and um, run through four holes in the top of the yoke. And so on the yoke we have our neck seats, which sit, as the name implies, on top of the neck. The belly of the yoke is in the very middle. Um, this ring here is referred to as the staple. And then, as I said, we have our bows, our bow pins, and our spacers. And so these spacers, you can use anything, block of wood, plastic, leather, um, and that helps to fit the bow specifically to the animal's neck to make sure they don't soar up during work. So these guys, the bows aren't fitted very specifically because they're not pulling anything heavy as of yet. Uh, but with a larger team, you'd want it to fit um, just right so that once again, they didn't soar and they didn't have anything to, to fear or not look forward to while they're working with you. So right now I'm gonna disassemble this. So my pins come out. So do my spacers, and I am going to take these. I'm going to set them in front of the cab so that I have very easy access to them. And um, also, even doing things like this, making noise, this is called desensitizing. So these guys aren't naturally around loud noises or banging or anything scary. So by doing that, you can see they're not phased by it because we've been practicing. Um, when you take them out, say if you're going to take them into a public setting or uh, pull around a noisy piece of machinery or equipment, they wouldn't be scared. So by doing that, from the time they're young, they grow up with it. Um, and it doesn't make them nervous early on. So boom, just took a step back as I put the bow over his neck. And so we don't want him to be nervous about yoking. So that's just because he's still 
a little antsy, a little, a little nervous around me. Come here. So I don't want him to pull back on the halter. There. So we just do that until he's relaxed. As you can see, Indy didn't really mind that at all. And I'm gonna take my yoke. I'm gonna set it over their necks like that. And so they're both pulling back a little bit. And so right now this yoke is, is free sitting. If one of them was to move too much, it would fall to the ground. So you wanna be kind of focused in getting the bow secured under their neck and securing the yoke to the feet, like so. And so now we're gonna secure the bows in place with our spacers. And so your bow pins, this is a little bit of a controversial topic, um, but you can see this right here is, is a hitch pin, it's like a cotter pin. And this round part, I always like to put facing backwards. Because if I was to have a team, say in the woods, and they went forward facing into a brush pile or a, a clump of trees and got stuck. The only way I'm ever gonna be able to get in there and pull the pins out so that I can unyoke them and get them out of trouble is if they're backward facing like that. Because if they're forward facing, I might not be able to access or have access around their heads or horns. So that is a really simple detail, but also a safety measure. So that, back like that. So this yoke is on these calves right now. And you can see these boys are wearing rope halters. This is another training tool. Training starts by teaching them to lead or stay with you. And so eventually they'll graduate from wearing these halters to just listening to cues I offer with my voice, my body, and my driving tool. We call this a whip, not because we hit our animals. This is what we use to give them physical cues. So I'll touch specific parts of their body to tell them what I want them to do. And um, with practice, those will turn into visual cues. So say if I touch their butts to tell them to go, eventually they'll learn to just watch this whip come up behind them and they'll learn that that means to move forward. Um, for right now, they're pretty new to the yoke, so I like to keep the halters on them. With Indy, who we refer to as our off steer, or the steer on the right, farthest away from me, I'm gonna make a loop in his lead like this run it through the staple or the ring and hook it to this bow so I don't have him in my hand but if I need to encourage him or correct him in any way it's pretty easy to, to grab hold of him. So you can see these boys are already moving that's a really good sign. Um, the biggest part of training is teaching these calves how to move off of your body language. Whoa! And um, you can see there's no tension on this they're just very in tune to where I am and what we're about to do. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So, before we start to move, I'm going to review our five basic commands. So, the first two commands, we always teach our commands in pairs, is get up, or step up, which is go forward, and whoa, which is stop. Whoa is your most important command, it's like driving a car, you wouldn't want to drive a car without brakes. Um, so we teach those on the halter, and then once we introduce the yoke, we start to teach our turning commands, which is haw for left and g for right. And then our fifth and most advanced basic command is backing up. And that's, I consider that to be more advanced because they can't see directly behind them. So once again, going back to trust, it takes a lot of trust between the team and the team for, for the team to back straight and willingly um, into an area that they potentially can't see. So I'm going to raise my whip, say get up. And so that was a visual command there. Very good. And praise is also important with these boys, so when they do a good job, you'll hear me say, good boy. Get up. Get up. And I'll refer to them specifically by name, too. They do learn their name, and they do learn to apply that during work, so that you can refer to them individually. Whoa. 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 Mm. Now we're going to demonstrate a figure eight, whoa, Wendy, back a step, through these cones, off to my right, and um, 
what you're going to see, I'm going to be touching them on their legs and shoulders and also moving my body in front or to the side to signal them where I want them to go. And I'll also be using my verbal command. So I'm going to tell them, get up, which is forward. And if you see me put this whip in front of them and tap their knees, that just tells them to slow down. You'll hear me say, easy. And that keeps them with me. So if I want them to come haw, I'm going to tap Indy on his shoulder, say haw, Indy haw. Step up. So Boone should slow down a little bit, just like that. And Indy will speed up. Step up. Good boy. Come up. Good. Good boy. So that's a haw turn. And then just the opposite with a G turn. Indy, off to the right here, is going to slow down. Easy, Indy. And Boone should speed up. Easy, Indy. Good. So I'm going to position them now. In the haw. In the haw turn. So Boone will eventually learn to watch my body go toward his hip to signal a haw turn. And I go toward his hip just to give him room to turn towards me. So I'm going to try and straighten them out. Whoa. And so they're easy. Oh. Good. There are specific commands to teach them how to move just their back ends or just their front ends. These calves don't know that yet. So I just move his rear end to the left. The command for that for him would be put in. Um, but as I said, I haven't taught that to them yet. So I just use my hand instead to keep from getting them confused. So right now I'm going to ask them to back up. And um, there are two approaches to this. The traditional approach is tasked with a light amount of pressure and very steadily increase pressure until they um, react. I personally just like to ask with a light amount of pressure, specifically when they're young like this, until they either pick up their foot or move it backwards. And um, that will keep them <coughs> from tossing their heads or putting their heads down in refusal to actually move, um, which is a common problem you'll see with this, just because this is a really unnatural movement, the back boys. And we've practiced this a little bit. Easy, Andy. Back boom. And what I want to see is a, a straight line backwards. Whoa. So Indy's getting a little carried away, which is a good problem to have. Whoa. And so, I'm going to step them up. Whoa. And you can see Indy. That straighten them out a little bit. Whoa, Indy. Indy put his butt out to the side again. So I'm going to move him in, just like that. <coughs> and so I don't want them to take more steps backwards than I'm asking for. So they're anticipating what I want, but I want them to wait until I touch them. There you go. Back. Good boys. Back. Good boys. Back. Indy. Good. And you can see how light this pressure is on their legs. Back. Good. And as soon as they take a step back, I take that pressure away. Once again, that's a relief. That's their reward. Good. Back. Good. So that was really good. That was slow and straight, and they did exactly what I asked of them. So they do something really good like that. <laughs> Getting into a little flight zone trouble here, but I like to get down on their level and share a little bit of love with them. Tell them they did a good job. Good. Good boy. Get up. Get up. Oh. Good. Good. So right now, as I said before, they haven't been hooked up to anything equipment-wise yet. They've just been ground driving like this in the oak. So we have our little training cart over here. And I'm going to introduce it to them today. Whether or not we actually hook on will be up to them. Uh, but they haven't seen this, haven't smelled it. So what we're going to do is in order for them to be hooked up onto this, <coughs> one of them needs to step over the pole in order to line up. So I want them each to step over the pole. Then we're going to do around. Do it again. Boom. Step up. So 
I won't force them. I'll let them figure this out in their own time. Good boy. Okay, I'm gonna ask for Hawk. Hawk. Good. Oh, so I'm gonna let them <clears throat> look at this part, the actual cart, because this is us gonna be following them. And I need them to understand that it's gonna move. And so, personality-wise, these boys are, are very different. Boone is a little timid, and Indy is pretty curious. So you can see Boone took, is taking right now a step back, while Indy is staying put, which is nice. But I just wanted them to see that that was actually going to move, because to them, any moving object could be living, could be dangerous. Uh, but they stayed relatively calm. So I'm going to see right now if they'll hook up for me. So I want Indy to step over the pole and turn haw. Now this is a maneuver that takes practice, but he's doing a very good job. So he, up. So he needs to move all four feet over the pole. Whoa, right there, good boy. And then who needs to straighten out? So back up. This is where that trust comes in. I need to ask them to back up a step toward an object that they have no idea about. Good. Whoa. So. Indy. Good. So typically, when you're hooking up a cart, you'll have what they call a T-pin, which is a T-shaped pin that goes through a hole. We right now just have bailing twine. <laughs> Little farmer's fix here. Hi. And so this goes through. I'm going to go nice and slow. There's going to be some noises there I'm sure about and some motions and so I want to be completely sure that they're going to be okay with this when this is actually hooked on to them. So I also want to make sure that their focus is on me. Good. So you never want to rush this. Especially the first time you ever do something, you always want to make sure it's positive because this is going to be the beginning of their foundation for pulling a cart in the future. So if anything about this is scary, all I'm doing is making training more difficult the next time we go to hook on. So we're just going to take this at their pace. I'm paying attention to them and listening to them to know when and if they're a little uncomfortable. So that is securely on the yoke. And before they move, I had previously put Indy's rope halter over Boone's bow so that he was more independent and free moving. Because they've never pulled this before, I want to be holding on to both of them in case he gets scared. So I have both leads. And we're going to keep this short and sweet. All I'm going to do is ask them to do a G and a ha turn around those cones, and then we're going to be done. And so what you're going to see is when they turn, one is going to have his butt out way out to the side, and the other one is going to be getting pushed by the pole. And that's because they don't know how to sidestep yet. That's a much more advanced command and comes with time practicing on a piece of equipment like this. So right now we're just going to come up. And they might jump a little bit. They might go a little faster. Put something behind them. Whoa. So what we do is we go forward and we stop and go forward and stop. And that's to remind them they have brakes. Yep. Whoa. Good boy. There's a little jump. That's okay. It's okay to reassure them. Get up. And whoa. Good boy. Whoa. Good boy. Get up. Get up. Good. Get up. You can see I'm not getting loud or excited. Whoa. They're scolding them for jumping. They're allowed to react how they're going to. So I'm just staying completely calm. Because even though they're focused on what's behind them, they're still in tune to me and my energy and emotion. So if I stay calm and act like it's no big deal, 
They're much more apt to be relaxed by the end of our session. So what we don't want is him to try and turn and look at that. I'm going to step him in. There we go. So I won't unhook these guys until Boone calms down a little bit. To Indy, this is nice because it's not really that big of a deal. Once again, personality-wise, he's not as spooky as Boone is. That's one of the reasons why I have them yoked like they are, so that Boone is next to me and I can reassure him much more easily. Good luck. So he's a little hesitant to move and that's okay. I'm going to encourage him. There we go. Get up. Go ahead. Get up. I'm going to try and keep him moving now. Get up. Go ahead. He didn't really jump that time, which is good. So now we're going to try easy a G turn. Easy. And so Boone is going to stick his butt out. And Indy, it's his turn to get pushed over by the pole. It's going to look a little awkward, and it is a little awkward. But as I said, it will get better with practice. Step up. go. So that's good when Boone takes a step out in front of Indy because he's pushing that turn around. Get up. Get up. So if he doesn't want to turn, I'm just going to ask him to go straight. There. Now we'll turn. Good boy. So you can see they're both relaxed now. That was really a low-key introduction. Nobody got too excited. Whoa. Now Boone might start to jump again because it's his turn to have the pole touch his legs, which is really kind of a, a foreign feeling, pretty unnatural. But once again, as a teamster, it's my job to show him that that's okay and to get him comfortable and acclimated to it so that he's successful working in the future. We're gonna haw. We're gonna slow Boone down, easy Boone, touching his legs, asking you to come haw. So I'm using both the halters, my voice, my body, and my whip right now to tell them where I want them to go. Not an excessive amount of anything, but there's enough to communicate very clearly to them. Good boy. So this right here is the working dynamic you want, huh, Andy, when they're hooked up. This is really good. Like I said, we're going to keep it short and sweet. So we're going to walk back over to where we hooked on. And then I will unhook them and unyoke them for the day and tell them what good boys they are. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So this is my most recent investment into my business. This is a 32-foot um, custom-made horse trailer. It wasn't custom-made for me. I bought it as it is. And so this is what we use for events like weddings and um, wagon rides that would happen a distance away from our farm. And this trailer in particular, it's split into two different sections. The front section here, you can see where this ramp opens is where um, the animals go for transportation. And then the very back portion is um, completely closed off from the front and it's equipped with an electric winch and that is where all of our carriages and wagons are pulled into um, as we move from place to place. So our most recent event was a wedding and actually our wedding carriage called a vis a -vis, is still in the back here. And if you give me a moment, you can watch as we open this up. A little bit of a process. Here's that. Here's that. Well, look.
look at this. Yes. And so you see this ramp folds down. And if you were to look into the very front, there's a winch and a cable that hooks to the front of the wagon or carriage. And it pulls it in or lets it out. Um, so it actually allows one person to load or unload with the team. And, and which animals do you use with this? This is for my Percheron draft horses. Um, typically, we would not hook cattle to this, only because horses tend to be a lot cleaner to pick up after than cattle do, and also quite a bit fancier, just aesthetically. So So this is where people get married? Yes. Oh, <laughs> good one. This story has been a learning experience to follow a day in the life of a large animal trainer. The purpose of this story is to demonstrate how draft animals can be part of the solution to fossil fuel emissions, plus be enjoyable to train. It has been great to work with Kele, especially as she was just as patient with me, the cameraman, as she is with her animals. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.